You guys ready to get started? Ready to get into the word? It's a good thing, because that's what we're going to do. Well, my name is um, Sally Van Wick. I'm the pastor's wife here at Calvary Chapel Bible Fellowship. And I just want to welcome you to our Bible study in the book of Romans. It's a little bit different than what we've been doing the last few years. This is an inductive Bible study. And tonight, while we're in here, after we're done um, with the worship session, we're going to get into a little bit of the lesson one, which is really just the introduction to the study, to show a few steps of how to study your Bible inductively. We're going to look at it, how to do a chart and how to do a word study. So hopefully I won't keep you too long in here, but I kind of wanted to at least give that introduction so that when you go home and you start working on lesson two, which is the overview of the book of Romans, you'll have an idea of how the, the Bible study was written so that you can follow along with that without getting lost. Or not, you know, you can put the Bible study book away and just read the Bible and we're good with that too. So, God, and we're here tonight and we ask you, Lord, to just come and fill us with your presence. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Because, God, we know that it's your spirit that teaches us all things and leads us into truth. It's your spirit that strengthens us. God, and it's your spirit that teaches us about who you are. Lord, we just love your name. Lord, we love to learn about your name. For Lord, your name is, is where the healing begins and it's where the healing takes place. Lord, it's your name that the enemy trembles. It's at your name that you part the waters. It's at your name that you swallow up the enemy. God, it's at your name that we have victory. It's in the name of Jesus. Yet Lord, your word tells us in Psalm 138, that you have magnified your word above your name. And so, God, as we come, as we come as women that want to be women of your word, Lord, we want to study your word so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. God, that we can allow your spirit to apply it to our lives, that it would make a difference in the way we live our lives. God, because we know we will act on what we believe. So, Father, we just pray that you would meet us here tonight. Lord, that you would be with each and every one of these ladies right where they're at in life. God, everybody comes into this room with different hurts, different trials, different situations, different victories. And so, God, we pray tonight that you would be a personal God to each and every one of us. And, Lord, as we open your word, Lord, through the book of Romans, we pray that we would grow in your grace. For, Lord, that is our desire, to grow in your grace and knowledge. So, Father, we just commit this time to you. In the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's women say, amen. amen. It is so good to see you guys here tonight. I just would like to see a show of hands of how many of you this is the first time you've been to a Bible study at CCBF. Quite a few of you. Awesome. Well, welcome. We're really glad that you decided to come, and we hope that you continue. <laughs> That's always the test. And so tonight, my goal is not to scare anyone away, okay? So, but what I want to do is um, we've been using different studies in the past, so those that have been here know that. And I've had several of the women approach me saying, Sally, you need to write a study so that we can study inductively. So... This summer, I've been in a cave all summer writing, and I, I take absolute blame for the typos in this book. Um, but I know that God's word is right, and his word will lead us, right? So I just want to give you that disclaimer. It did not go through editing. It just came out of this crazy brain, and that's a scary thing, really. But before we start the Bible study tonight, we're going to do something different. I just want to go through the lesson one in your booklets. Everybody should have a booklet. And we're going to, I'm not good with slideshows, so you're going to have to just give me grace. And by the end of the study, you'll understand. But I want to kind of go through what inductive Bible study is, how to study your Bible inductively. And what we know is there's three different methods of Bible study. Number one, the inductive, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Inductive Bible study simply pulls the facts out of the text using the Bible as our primary source. So we just want to know what the Bible says. My husband teaches at the Bible College, and he tells the kids, because there's required commentaries, you have to buy the commentary 
but you can read it when you want because the scripture interprets scripture. Amen? Commentaries are regurgitated by men who have studied the scripture and tell us what they got out of the scripture. So when you study inductively, you're basically writing your own commentary. Isn't that exciting? And it's just for you to read. Nobody's going to check your answers or check anything. This is just for you to dig into the word. Now, the other types of Bible study is you've got deductive. It starts with a premise, a presupposition, or a preconceived idea, or we could say a topic. And so deductive studies are topical. There's nothing wrong with them, but that's not what we're doing. We're going to be doing inductive. Then the third one, which I, you know maybe a lot of you are used to, it's I don't like this kind of study. It is sharing opinions, how we feel about the word of God. And you know, quite frankly, I don't want to offend anybody, but it really doesn't matter how we feel about the word of God, does it? It's what does God's word say? And sometimes it can be painful. Sometimes it can hurt so good because it corrects us and instructs us and hopefully changes us. And it helps us to die to the flesh and live to the spirit. So again, we will be looking at inductive Bible study. Now there's three steps to Bible study. In your questions every day, it should, st it should start out, if I did it right, to prayerfully read or prayerfully or pray. Or there's always prayerfully before we start anything every day, we need to pray. First, um, 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So we, we can study. My, I remember a teacher in high school that would say, study, study till you go nutty. So we can study, study till we go nutty. And we can learn all this stuff in our head. But unless it's spiritually taught, it means nothing. It's head knowledge. And we know that knowledge puffs up. Puffs up. And so we don't want to be in that category. We need to pray and ask the Spirit because we know in John 14, 26 that it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us all things and brings all things to our rem remembrance that which he has said. So we want to know what Jesus wants to speak to our heart. So that's why we pray. And then number two, we need to have a desire. If we don't desire to know Jesus, it's all for nothing. What is our desire? We need to check our desire. Um, 1 Peter 2.2 2 tells us that as newborn babes, we are to desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. So we need to desire. And that desire is something that the Spirit can put in our hearts as we pray. And then thirdly, that it involves a commitment. I love what David said in 2 Samuel 24.24 24, where he said, I will give the Lord nothing, that which costs me nothing. In other words, what I give to the Lord is going to be costly. It's going to cost me. And ladies, to study the word of God costs us. It costs us sleeping in. It costs us watching TV, which we, I don't know about you. Well, we're not going to go there today. Um, it, it may cost you something that your flesh enjoys. And that's the whole point, is to die to the flesh and feed the spirit, because whatever we feed will grow. Well, there's three steps to inductive Bible study. Number one, observation. And then number two, interpretation. Number three, application. So let's look at those. Number one, step one of inductive Bible study is observation. And that's simply asking ourselves, what does the text say? Now, we're, I'm going to drive this down into the ground, but context is key. It all revolves around context. We'll look at that in a minute. But it's, observation is reading with a purpose. This is the step that is tedious that we want to rush through. I don't know about you, but a lot of times the first question is, read Romans 1, 1 through 18. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you get to the question, and then you go back and start looking in Romans 1, 1 through 18. You don't read it. Observation is reading the text. It's, it's asking yourself, what does it say? We need to look for the who, what, where, when, why, and how. We need to look for people, for places, for things. Um, we look for the historical, the political, and the religious setting which the text was written. This is the part that we, we record facts and what about is about what is being said. This is where we will make charts and lists if you want to. And you might want to get a separate 
a journal to where you can really go crazy with it if you want to. I've put a few in the studies to kind of whet your appetite and to get you to be thinking in those terms. And then in the observation step, it's discovery, really, basically is what it is. We ask ourselves, what do I, did I learn about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit? And we can say, what did I learn about the key theme or key words? Key words are words that are just simply repeated over and over. We know that the author is trying to get a point across when he repeats things, right? And so we look for those. We can ask ourselves, what did we learn about the enemy's goals? What are his goals in our life? What, is the, what are the enemy's tactics? How does he try to accomplish those goals? And then what did we learn new from the passage this week? We can also ask ourselves, what did we learn about God's goals for us? And what about God's tactics and how he wants to accomplish those things in our life? Now, you'll be giving a, get, getting a bookmark in your groups, and this is the first part of the bookmark. So you'll have those reminders constantly. And then step two of inductive Bible study is interpretation. This simply is asking yourself, what does the text mean? Not necessarily what does it mean to me or how I feel about it, but what does it mean? And so we need to remember always context is key. We need to find the meaning, meaning of what is being said to those the book is written to at the time it was written. So we can't read into the context. We can't say, well, he probably said this or he's probably being sarcastic. We don't read into it. We just ask ourselves, what does the text mean? And remember, our minds always want to look for the obscure things. Don't we just love to hear something new? Ooh, I've never heard that before. Wow. Well, I got news for you. If it's new, it's, it's probably not true. Because God's word is enduring forever, and it means what it means. So we need to look for the plain things. Those are the main things are the plain things. And there's typically one interpretation, but there's many applications. So this point is where we're looking for the interpretation in context. Then step three of inductive study is application. This is all of our goal. After we learn what the text says and then what the text means, then we want to know how does it apply? How is this going to, knowing this fact, knowing the word of God, how is it going to change my life? How should I act in light of this, um, what we've just learned? So it's the final step and it's allowing God's word to sink deep into our heart and speak to us. And then we respond to what we learn. Application can vary from person to person, and this is very important. There's one interpretation, but there's applications. Depending on what you're going through in your life, you're going to, God's going to apply it differently to your life so that you can use it and change and grow. Um, then the proper application will bring personal conviction. It will bring instruction and transformation in your thinking about your actions. Super important. It's not going to bring transformation in the actions of others. It's for me. It's personal application, and we need to be careful to guard against that, that be thinking it's for someone else all the time. Well, now the second part of your bookmark is going to have the response or application questions. We need to ask ourselves, is there a sin to avoid? Is there a warning to heed? Is there a command to obey, a good example to follow, or a promise to claim? Now, when we go through the Bible study, I want to show you the difference between two types of forming a question. And the first one, it, it starts in our observation, the first step of inductive Bible study. But we see questions in written form. And this is what we've seen in the last couple of years in the Bible studies that we've done is the written form of questions. And it would read something like, read Romans 5, 1 through 11. And after listing what is being said about the following, give a title or summary to the passage. Number one, Jesus Christ. So you're going to read Romans 5, 1 through 11 and pull out what it says about Jesus. Then you're going to read it and pull out what it says about God and then the Holy Spirit. And then after you're done doing that, you give a title or summary to what that passage means. Everybody got that? Pretty simple, pretty easy. Well, there's another way of forming that question and that's putting it in a chart form. 
I personally like boxes. <laughs> I like, you know, the organization. And what I like about the chart form is that you have more room to write your thoughts down. This is what a chart looks like. You're going to list down the verse and what it says about Jesus. Then you're going to list the verse and what it says about God. But you read the, cha the, the passage one time looking for Jesus. You finalize the column about Jesus. You're reading the passage and pulling him out. Then the next time you read the same passage, you're looking for the word God and all of the personal pronouns that go with that. You list everything you find out about God. Then you read it through for the Holy Spirit and list everything that you want to find from the Holy Spirit. Now, because of time, we could do that exercise right now, and I was kind of planning on that, but I really want you guys to get to your groups. So I'm going to give you a cheat sheet here, and I'm going to show you how you can do this. This is personally how I do my study for the overviews. I take the scripture and I print, I do everything on the computer. So that that's, if you're a computer person, this is a good way. Otherwise it doesn't work very well. But I take the scripture, I double space it, the passage that I'm studying that week. And I make myself my own scripture on my paper. Then I go through and as I read through it, I will mark those key things and those key peoples, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. And I, sometimes I just circle, underline, cross through. Um, and I wanted to show you just a few things that I do on a consistent basis is when I come across the word Jesus, if you pick up my Bible and look at my Bible, when it says Jesus, I always have a cross over it. And then all the he's and the whom's that refer to Jesus have a cross over it. So I know the, the one scripture that's really good with doing this is where it says that all things will be un, under his feet, that the world will be a footstool under his feet, you know, the one in John. It's like it goes from God to Jesus, from God to Jesus, from God to Jesus. And it's like, who is he talking about? But as you really study it, you can triangle it or cross it. And now I know who he's talking about through that passage. So it's just a habit that I have but it's a way of marking things as you're filling out the charts. You can get colored pens, you can do symbols, or you don't have to do anything. This is just a tool, so it's not to overwhelm anyone. Uh, God, the Elohim, the triune God, I always put a triangle, and then the Holy Spirit, actually I do just a little bird, you know, from kindergarten drawing. That's what I usually do with the Holy Spirit. You could circle him. You can underline him. You can do whatever you want. Just receive him. <laughs> but anyway, so this is what the sample chart will look like, uh, the text will look like, and then you'll see the sample chart right next to it. And there it is a little bit bigger where we've filled in under the column of Jesus. Everything is in red with Jesus. Everything with God is pink and underlined. And then the Holy Spirit is red, red. I don't know why I didn't do a different color for that, but I didn't. So you would want to do blue or something different if you wanted to do that. Um, so anyway, does everybody understand that it's the same question, but in a different form? So when you see the charts, some people, the way they think, they don't think like I do. I have a sister-in-law that sees charts, and she just freaks out. Like, Ugh, what do I do? She doesn't like charts because she likes the written form, but it's the same question. So you can still answer it the same way if you can just kind of try to remember that. But remember, beyond everything, this is a tool. And we know that we don't always use all our tools, do we? So if you like this tool, use it. If you don't, don't. Now, how to complete a word study. That's the second thing that we want to look at tonight. Um, and what we want to do with the word study is this is on what's on the screen here is on your Bible study page nine of your booklet. It's just recommended tools for word studies and there's um, Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias as well. You don't need to get any of them. It's okay if you don't want to get any of them, but if you do want to get them, you'll see the little asterisk next to Sparrow Zodiades, complete word study dictionary my all-time favorite, the most amazing study tool. You don't need any other dictionary if you have his because it's by far the most complete. It's an excellent tool. Um, but all the other ones are good too. I work off PC Study Bible that has all of these on my computer program. So I have access to all of them. Uh, let's see. I want to give you the sample word study. And we're going to get back to the study tools 
to make sure that you guys have those at your fingertips when you need them. But the word study we're going to be looking at, the sample is from Romans 3, and it's actually from Romans 3.25. So we'll jump right into that. Whom God, speaking of Jesus Christ, set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his, in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now, you're going to notice that I put numbers. When I say look up the word propitiation, it's going to have in parentheses numbers. Those numbers are the Strong's number that are keyed to the King James Version. By putting the number in there for you, I've saved an awkward step of you having to go to a Strong's and look up the word and find the number. So you've got the number. It saves you a step. And those numbers will be keyed to your Bible dictionaries. So you need these numbers to be able to look up a Greek or Hebrew word. The New Testament is in Greek. The Old Testament is in Hebrew. Um, every word, again, is keyed to the King James Version, and um, they'll be supplied. So here's the sample word. I was so blessed. I love word studies. It's a huge part of my Bible study. I love word studies. The words don't change the meaning of the text, but it's like an onion that can pull layers off of the meaning of the text. This, this summer when I wrote this study, I came across the word propitiation, and I camped in it for about two weeks. And I've only given you like a small little portion of what I found in Zodiades, but I was in awe. I mean, it was just one of those God moments when I looked up this word. And if you get a chance and you have a Zodiades, you've just got to camp out. But I'm just going to, um, it basically means that it's the lid or the covering of the Ark of the Covenant made of pure gold on before which the high priest was to sprinkle the blood of the expiator sacrifices on the day of atonement. And it is where the Lord promised to meet his people. I mean, we could really stop right there, and that's pretty powerful. But I highlighted what really blessed me. It says, Jesus Christ is designated not only as the place where the sinner deposits his sin, but he himself is the means of expiation. And then dropping down, the idea is God himself, who out of his great love for sinners, provided a way by which his wrath against us may be averted. You know, a lot of times people say, how can a loving God send people to hell? And that's their excuse for not believing. But that's not what, that's, it shows that he is so loving that he provided the way by which his wrath against us might be averted. He provided a way for us not to have to go to hell. It's just our choice to accept it. And then this is what really, really hit me this summer, is we do not select the sacrifice. God has provided the sacrifice on our behalf. How many times do I say, well, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go see R-rated movies. I'm, not, I'm just going to sacrifice that. Like somehow I'm doing God a favor. We don't choose the sacrifice. Jesus Christ was chosen as the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because God loves us that much. The propitiation, he is our meeting place. It reminds me of Romans 5.8 where it says that while we were in our sins, Christ died for us. It reminds me of Hebrews where it says that we are now able to go boldly before the throne of grace to find help and grace in time of need. Because of Jesus, he ushers us into that holy place. So it gives you an idea of just reading over a word, and when you stop and you go look it up, it's amazing. Now, the word study is amazing, and it's my favorite, but we have to remember that we do not change the context of the passage because of the meaning of the word, which is really easy for us to do. As we start looking at all the definitions, we can come back to the passage and go, but the word means this, so this is mu must be what this means. No, context always rules. And if the word, if, if one of the definitions is contrary to the context, then we've got the wrong definition. Does that make sense? Because context always rules. For instance, 
1 Timothy 2.12. Our favorite passage in the whole Bible is 1 Timothy 2. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but be in silence. That's our favorite, right? Well, it, it just goes on and we're like, what in the world does this mean? Well, as we remember the context is key, the word the, the part of the word context, con, means with. We need to look at with the text is what that means. So we must look at the text within its environment because the context is the situation or setting in which the idea or a subject exists or occurs. Context always rules interpretation. In, uh, for an instance, we think of the word sharp. If someone were to walk in here and I were to say, it was so sharp, you're not going to know what I was talking about. It could be the cheese in the buffet line. It could be the suit that someone was wearing. It could be the knife that I was preparing the food for the, and I cut myself with. Or it could be someone was so intelligent, right? Or something was so intelligent. We don't know what the word means until we put it in the context. So I would have to say, I was in the kitchen tonight cooking dinner and cut my finger because it was so sharp. Then you know what sharp I'm talking about. And it's much the same with word studies. We need to be very careful to make sure that context is key. Back to our text in, in 1 Timothy 2, we see that when we look up the word, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man or dominate a man, or, but to be in silence or gentle quietness. We know that when we look for the definition of the word woman, 1135, it's gune, meaning that it could be translated either wife or woman. Now, while the word wife fits there, because we know that a wife is to be subject to her own husband, we see that in scripture, we know that the word is probably better fit with woman in general, because it's not speaking of a husband-wife relationship. So it, it's the same word used in Matthew 5, 28, where Jesus said that whoever looks at a woman, there's the word, to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. Well, if that's the word wife, if we replace that word with wife, we're going to be in big trouble for our poor husbands, right? That doesn't fit. So we have to look at the context. It's woman. Now, by continuing in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we know what the context is. as it's a, it's a pastoral epistle. In other words, it's an instruction for the church proper. That, God, that Paul says that I do not permit a woman to hold the place of a senior pastor to be teaching over or having authority or dominating over the men from the pulpit is basically what he's talking about. So we know that that word is not wife, but woman in general. We do not permit a woman to have the authority over the church, basically, is what he's saying. And then we go further with it, and we see that the totality of Scripture agrees because we see it that Scripture interprets Scripture. You can see Colossians 3.18, Ephesians 5.22 through 33, 1 Peter 3.1, 1 Peter 3.7 1 through 10, 1 Corinthians 11.7 through 9, 1 Timothy 2.11 through 15, and Titus 2.3 through 6. They all agree, talking about the same subject. So we know what the proper definition is because of the context that it is in, the environment that it's in. Does everybody get that? Do you understand? Okay, good. And then here we go back to page nine of lesson one in your booklet is the inductive Bible study resources. Now, it, this is, again, not required, but if you want help or you want study tools, here are some good recommendations. Now, I put Springs of Life Bookstore at the Hot Springs, but I found out after this morning that they will not order the Zodiades Complete Word Study Dictionary. I'm not really sure why, but they don't order those. So this is where you can get them. You can get them at olivetree.com, and I think if I'm not mistaken, you can get them used there, so they're cheaper. You can get them at CBD or ChristianBook.com. That's where I got mine. And I think they're on sale right now. You can go to Amazon.com and they're used. We, uh, someone got one for $19, I think. They're regularly like $38 or $35, something like that. And so those are some online sites that you can buy them if you're interested. We have a sample of that in the foyer on the media counter if you want to look at it. 
It's a ginormous book. It is not on the computer. I know Clark actually got the program from Spiro Zodiades himself, so he has it, but he's a cheater because we can't get it. We have to look at it the book form. So I do all of my study on the computer, but I also have Zodiades on my desk. So that's what I use. But um, in your Bible study, if you'll turn to page 7, you'll see the difference with the different books. Um, I just pulled out three different samples of definitions. All that the Strong's Dictionary had was this one sentence, which is fine. If you have a Strong's at home and that's what you want to use, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's a very small definition. Then Zodiades, I only took a portion. There was four columns, two full pages of Zodiades' definition of the word propitiation. I just pulled out what really blessed me to share with you. And then the Nelson's illustrated um, Bible dictionary is really good too. His, I liked what he had to say. Thus, propitiation expresses the idea that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for sin, which a holy God demanded of, uh, demanded of man the sinner. So, I mean, that talks about it as well, just a little more concise. So there's three different, um, and then it goes on, but there's three different definitions, and you can see the difference in the depth, except Zodiades just goes on and on and on and on and on, and it's very interesting. And he usually keys it to the scripture that you're in. You go through his, and you look for the scripture that you're studying, and you'll find the context, which I really like about that. And then we usually bring it back to application where we would say define propitiation in your own words. And I would say that Jesus is my throne of grace. Jesus is where I meet a holy God. There's no other way. So it's, it, that's what we do with the word studies. And you'll be coming across those um, in your Bible study. And that brings us to the fact that they are... Um, the only required materials you're going to need for this Bible study is your Bible, your Bible study book, a highlighter, and, and you can use a Webster's Dictionary if that's all you have and that's all you want to deal with. But remember, that's the English word. It's not the Greek or Hebrew word. But it can have some really good insights, so there's nothing wrong with using the Webster's. And then colored pens or pencils are a good idea, but actually they're not even necessary as well. So I hope I didn't make the Bible study like intimidating or clear as mud, but hopefully this helps you to understand how it was written and that it's not written to intimidate or to cause people heartache or headache. If you don't even pick up your Bible study and you have read through the scripture, you are good to go. We don't have a rule that unless you've finished every little question, you don't get to share because the Spirit of God is alive and He is not bound to this book. He is speaking to us through this book. And this is just a guide to take us through this. But if this is too overwhelming for you and you're working 50, 60 hours a week and you can't get to every question, don't stay home. Please come because you need the fellowship. And we will be meeting in here every Thursday night at 7 o'clock sharp we get started. Tonight we had a little wiggle room because of the registration. But we start 7 o'clock sharp with worship with Jude. And then we will be doing a teaching overview of the passage that we've studied this week, each week. And so even if you don't get to your study, you still will get something out of it. And you're going to get to have some rich fellowship centered on the Word of God with some awesome ladies. And I mean, we have the best women in the world, don't we? I love you guys so much. You have so much of the joy of the Lord and the Spirit of God working through you. And I am so looking forward to getting into the book of Romans with you guys. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we will dismiss. Lord, we just thank you so much for your Word. God, that it's alive and Lord, we look forward to digging into the book of Romans. God, I need more grace. I have such a tendency to fall into the law and into those boxes that I need more of you, Jesus. And I know that there's women in here that feel the same way. And so, God, we look forward to looking into just who you are, studying your name, but studying your word. 
And Lord, that your word would come alive and sink deep within our hearts. I pray you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive all that you have for us in these last days that are waxing worse. God, we need to know you. We need that strength of your word because your word is what will strengthen us. Your word is, is our buckler. It's our high tower. It, it's a place for us to run and, and hide in the shadow of your wings. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we live in a place and a time where we are able to come together and study your word. So, Lord, not just about head knowledge, but sink deep into our hearts, we pray. Do a work, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, is there anybody in here that does not have a Bible study book or name tag? We did good. The registration was awesome. Okay, now if you haven't noticed, on your name tag, it has your room number. So you are now dismissed to go to the room on your room number and have a blessed time getting to know one another. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.